afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Let's start our first public event of the 2017 IPS Winter School. This roundtable is entitled Structuralism and After, IPS and the Critique of Limits. It's a, a great, great honor to have here with us Professor João Pontes Nogueira, at my left. Uh, João is professor of international of the International Relations Institute of Bukivrio, as I guess all we, we all know. Um, his research interests include international relations theory, international political sociology, inequality in world politics, and humanitarianism. He was a co-editor in chief with Professor Jeff Husemans of the ISA journal International Political Sociology, IPS, from 2012 and 2016, member of the editorial board of several national and international journals. His recent publications include From Failed States to Fragile Cities, published at the Third World Quarterly 2017, Global Governance and the Politics of Inequality in an edited volume entitled International Political Sociology, Transversal Lines, edited by Professor Rob Walker, among others. And from and 10 years of IPS, fracturing IPS, co-author with Professor Jeff Husemans, published at the 10th, the commemoration of the 10th anniversary of IPS. 2016. Uh, to my further left, I have the honor to introduce Professor Jeff Husemans. Professor Jeff Husemans is Professor of International Politics at Queen Mary University of London. His research interests include the politics of insecurity, the securitization of migration, critical methods of security studies, NIR. He was co-editor-in-chief with Professor João Pontes Nogueira of the ISA journal IPS, International Political Sociology, from 2012 until 2016. His recent publication include Critical Security, co-edited, among others, with Claudia Radal, Andrew Neal, uh, Democratic Curiosity in Times of Surveillance, published at the European Journal of Security Studies, 2016, and co-authoring with Professor João Pontes Nogueira, 10 years of IPS, fracturing IPS at the International Political Sociology Journal, 2016. To my right, I have the honor to introduce Professor Michael Shapiro. Mike is professor of the Department of Political Science at the University of Hawaii. His research and teaching interests include political theory and philosophy, the politics of aesthetics, politics of culture, indigenous politics, and the humanities. His recent publications include, among others, Cinematic Politics, 2009, a course that some of us had the honor to audit here in 2007. Uh, studies in Transdisciplinary Method after the Aesthetic Turn, 2012. War Crimes, Atrocity, and Justice, 2015. Also, uh, a book that some of us had the honor to, to have access uh, with his lectures given here a couple of years before. And Politics and Time, 2016. Finally, to my far right, uh, Professor Rob Walker, RBJ Walker. Rob, uh, Rob is professor of the Department of Political Science at the University of Victoria, Canada, and of our Institute of International Relations here at Pukki Hill. Uh, Rob is one of the founders and former co-editor-in-chief with Professor Didier Bigot of the ISA journal International Political, Political Sociology. His research and teaching interests include political theory, focusing especially in figures such like Machiavelli, Robbs, Kant, Weber, as I guess the PhD students already know very well. And, um, and also uh, various current contemporary political, social, and cultural theory and theorists. 
His recent publications include After the Globe, Before the World, 2010, Out of Line, Boundaries, Border, Borders, Limits, 2016, and International Political Sociology, Transversal Lines, 2016, an edited volume co-edited uh, co with Professor Didier Bigot, among others. So, having introduced the invited professors, I will give the floor to Professor João Pontes Nogueira, then to Professor Jeff Huesmans, then to Professor Mike Shapiro, and then to Rob. Uh, 15 minutes each. I will try no. to move around. So, give, tell me when. Yeah. So, João, I give you the floor, please. Thank you, Beto. Thank you, uh, Mike, Rob, and Jeff, for being here tonight. Um, I thank you all for being here um, at this hour to hear a debate, which is a bit, sounds a bit abstract, probably. You guys, I hope, I hope it will at least be lively, uh, even though abstract. Um, uh, so, uh, what I'm going to say here, I'm just going to talk about uh, part of uh, an essay that Jeff and I wrote for the anniversary issue of uh, 10th anniversary issue of IPS. It came out in December last year, uh, which is called um, 10 Years of IPS, Fracturing IR. Um, uh, in this essay, we try to do two things I think that are relevant. Um, first is to um, take stock of the contribution, but also of the limits of uh, international political sociology as a critique of IR. Uh, and, and we do that not uh, trying to establish some kind of uh, um, account with, the, uh, with IPS as a school or as a discipline or as an uh, intellectual uh, project, uh, but really based on our own experience in engaging with the, uh, with the editing of the journal, but also with the contributors of the journal. Uh, we also try to, um, on the second point, try to see what are the uh, uh, potentials of uh, the huge volume of work published in 10 years of the journal to develop, uh, or at least to, uh, not develop, but at least to be uh, true to the critical ethos of uh, international political sociology. Uh, and from this the uh, second attempt, uh, clearly there is an evaluation that uh, there are limits to the critique uh, IPS uh, started to do back in 2006 on the back of the uh, critical turn in IR. Uh, and part of that limit uh, has to do with, well, the title of today's panel, you know, the, the critique of limits. A lot of what IPS did, uh, we say in this article, has to do with uh, how the critique of limits, which was how uh, a lot of the critical turn of um, NIR discussed, uh, well, the limits of positivism and structuralism, but also the possibilities of uh, talking about difference uh, and resistance in IR. Uh, how the critique of limits was influential and instrumental uh, for alternatives, alternative uh, perspectives in IR. Uh, so we try to reflect on the limit of, of that critique as IR developed as mostly uh, a kind of reflection on how limits are drawn or boundaries or borders. So if you look at, at international political sociology, you will see that a lot of it is about situating politics at the limit or at the boundary. Um, be it in the reflection about mobility, in the reflection about refugees, in the reflection about deterritorialization, the reflection about the status of uh, globality or global society, so a lot of, of uh, reflections about 
the rigid spatialities of IR, on the one hand, and of processes and practices that uh, at some point seem to disturb first the linear uh, narratives of IR, but also the places where we, we thought IR were supposed to uh, take place, uh, mainly state boundaries, um, centers of power, um, institutions, and so forth. So I guess this, is this long effort to displace centers, which has a lot to do with post what post-structuralism do does, right? Post-structuralism says, well, the center is not at the center. The center is at the margin, right? So hence the problem of limits being so important. So you have to unfold the limit back or fold it back into the center to say, well, the center is not the center, right? There's no distinction really, at least a priori distinction between center and limits. These all are uh, well, contingent, uh, positive, or <coughs> results of uh, well, power and authority. So a lot of this work, which was uh, part of the empirical and research uh, that was done by IPS in these issues, uh, uh, which, which characterized what, what the journal, but also the community of IPS people did in these years, uh, had a lot to do with these lineages. The lineage of first, uh, well, structuralism, which was reflected in a lot of uh, critical work in the 80s and 90s. Mike and Robs, for instance, uh, are important references in, in this instance, uh, but also on the problematique uh, or the hermeneutics of limits, if you want. The fact that, well, knowledge is only possible uh, as far, well, the post Kantian realization, right? The knowledge is only possible as far as we recognize the limits of reason, right? The problem is, well, once you decenter these limits out of, well, the state or territoriality or reason or the universal, there's no real foundation for these claims of truth uh, and power. So what we try to do is to uh, link uh, IPS as an intellectual project to these lineages, which we thought were rich for the endeavor of critique, but what we also thought were a bit lost, we would say, in the uh, trajectory uh, of IPS, not just the journal, but IPS as a journal project, project, which was very broad, which included a lot of different kinds of research, a lot of different kinds of approaches. Uh, Jeff's going to mention a few of them. Uh, you know, Bourdieuism, Foucauldian, you know, assemblage theory, network theory, global society, post hubermising stuff, Lumen, well, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but we were interested because we thought, you know, there were some limits to the critique of limits. And this includes not just the IPS people who were doing research on the journal, uh, but there was also critique directed at the people who did the critique of limits. Read Rob, for instance, is an object of our of our interest here in this in this paper. That it didn't go far enough in what structuralism tried to do, which is a critique of grand narratives, right? A critique of the logic of critique having to recreate holes in order to negate things like globality, capitalism, sovereignty. Uh, so that was all a bit of our, our intent to do the critique of the critique. That's always uh, a sexy thing to do. We thought that you know it was interesting to do a critique of the critique, a critique of IPS as a mode of critique, right? Uh, but I th we thought that drawing on the work uh, by authors such you know like Mike, Rob, and others that were at you know at a turning point of the you know, of the critical term in uh, NIR and at the origins, well, not the origins, but at the genesis of IPS as, well, uh, a branch or at least a development of that movement, we thought it was, it was interesting to go back because we thought that some parts of these lineages were lost in the way 
And that's why, for instance, if you read Rob's uh, introduction to Out of Line, or Rob's introduction to Transversal Line, you'll see that he also is critical of IPS uh, in that sense. Uh, so what, uh, I have not much, what, what do we mean by after structuralism, right? Uh, so briefly, just to introduce uh, the problem. So what we think is that lineages of post-structural in IPS, you know, they do expose the limits of the critique of sovereignty, right? And the modern international as a social whole. So not only post-structuralism does a good job at deconstructing sovereignty, right? Uh, but we are concerned uh, in exploring how structuralism and the post of structuralism can do perhaps more work in looking at the sites where these, these contradictions emerge, right? And in resisting the temptation of reconstituting sovereignty or some kind of statism or some kind of political community as a whole that can be then criticized once again. So it's actually the narrative of the modern international and the understanding of the modern international as a social whole, which comes out of the critique of sovereignty, that we look at as being problematic. Right? That's, that's one thing. And then we, we try to look at structuralism as something that inherits, yeah, but also combats structuralism itself. Right? The post of structuralism. So, and then we look at the ambivalence that informs IPS scholarship because it draws so much on this critique but falls uh, prey to some, uh, how do you say that? Some traps set up uh, by the post of structuralism and by the critique of limits, limits, which is to look too much at the drawing of limits and boundaries, right? And redefine them. Or at least affirming, even contingently, certain totalities, such as the modern international, for instance, right? Because a lot of it is done on the basis of a certain critique of the finitude, of, of the problem of finitude in an hermeneutics of limits, such as the Foucauldian uh, critique, which is, uh, well, like in Derrida and Foucault, rejects the notion that we have to do think about ontology in order to think beyond you know the different levels of social holes and and uh, or disciplinary limits if you want in order to do critique so alternatively we try to argue that structuralism recovers this refusal of grand narratives that's what we try to to recover uh, the refusal to the search of origins, even if they are contingent origins, even if they are arbitrary origins. We look at the, the search for origins as uh, problematic for a proper critique of, for instance, uh, the plane of eminence, as the Lewis would say. Right? And also we try to resist the temptations of historicism. A lot of post-structuralist scholarship is, well, let's bring history back, temporality. Um, that is problematic because we risk, at times, of having to reconstitute the subject to deal with historical perspectives, or even if it is a decenter subject, but some kind of subjectivity, subjectivity that can be uh, uh, analyzed as constituted of the modern, uh, the modern international. So we try. I think it's important that IPS resists the linearities of historicism, and hence the notion that power is central to something. Uh, we also think structuralism, and here we're just drawing on the, you know, the, the classical structuralist words, uh, has a sensitivity to the event and an attention to historicizing the social in a non-theological way. Again, here we see critique of limits often falling into traps of having to, well, at least assume or at least work as a regulative, uh, with the regulative ambition of some kind of transcendence 
that is often teleological, or theological, or political theological. For us, that kind of reflection upon Linux of the political is problematic, because it draws, again, back in the reification of the state, the reification of sovereignty, and down the line to uh, the reification of social holes, or even the idea of the nation. So I think uh, IPS did a great job, we think, right, Jeff, uh, on the way of doing you know, uh, all kinds of analysis about decentral circulation of power, uh, the widespread and dispersed networks of uh, not just of institution, you know, the cohesiveness of certain regimes of knowledges and practices of government. You know, Barry Hindus has wrote a lot about that. Um, and I think IPS did follow it, on the other hand, on the dissatisfaction that was expressed by the post-structural move with spatial rigidity. You know, the move from the international to the world, mostly, which is very present in Rob's work. Um, but also, it, fall, it fell prey also to the notions of world society, globality, global governmentality, global governance, and so forth. Uh, the notion of global proliferated in IPS for a long time, and that we think is problematic. Uh, because all the category of the global does uh, suppose or assume that there's some kind of social hold that we can call global, or at least some kind of spatial configuration, uh, which is not just mental, not just in, in the, at the level of knowledge or phenomena, but space as a well, as a product of, uh, of human work, if you want. There's some kind of uh, space that is global and that could be understood as a social whole. That, that, that is a big problem. And um, uh, we'd like to you know, draw on structural and to speak about the political without falling into, the, falling into these traps, which bring us back to territoriality, even if it's the territoriality of the limits, of the boundary. Even if the boundary moves, but if we look too much at the boundary, even if it's moving, we cannot see what is it that is moving the boundary. Thank you. So here the problem becomes how to trace the link uh, and the articulation of practices uh, to a more fragile and contingent, if you want, space without reproducing globality as an expression of the international or the social whole. So here I think we, we kind of uh, depart a little bit from the notion that uh, the global cannot be posited as an expression of the modern international, but at the same time overlaps with what the modern international is. Um, if you read Rob's after the globe, before the world, um, sometimes, even though he distinguishes between both, he always says, we cannot get to the globe through the international. Uh, I would suggest the provocation that sometimes you cannot distinguish the globe from the international. Um, there's a lot about the world and the international, but not enough about the globe in Rob's book. Maybe he'll do it in the next book. But, what the globe is about is not is not there. So we think that you know, going back to structuralism and through a strategy of fracturing, we can't problematize these spatialities in ways that do not uh, perhaps limit our possibilities of critique to the restatement of the problematic of sovereignty or the sovereignty problematic as um, incorporated by IPS in the lineages of post-structuralism. Yeah, that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Juan. And um, I pass now the floor, the word to Jeff. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. Can, I, can you hear me? Because this, yeah? OK, because I can't hear myself. So that's OK then. Uh, so I'll probably say similar things, but with a different twist to it. Uh, I want to. Pardon? I we can hear you because you're speaking loud, but it's off. Use mine. This doesn't work then. 
Yeah, now we do. Does this look better? All right, then I need to sit still. This is going to be very challenging. Can I use this one? This one? I'll use two. There we go. Okay, let's have it at the start. I'm going to do... I'm going to draw on the same piece and conversations Joao and I have had ever since we wrote this uh, going on. And so in the 10 minutes, 15 I have, I want to start from the idea that with fracturing, the core idea about fracturing, which may sound paradoxical, is actually connecting. And so I'll try to come back to that. It's a claim that rather than focusing on limits, uh, that much of the, that some of the most creative work in IPS is taking place and probably going to take place around what generally can be, you know, I'll fill in the term, what's called connecting, and I'll try to unpack this. But let me start from a paradox that is inside IPS as a discipline, or I'm sorry, as an approach or a set of approaches is better word. Uh, that works in line with some of the critical lineage, or what now is called critical. But let me start that IBS is not, in the first instance, about just limits. It is about connecting. It's about, at the epistemological level, or in terms of disciplinary elements, it's about connecting the social, the political, the international. What goes on if you actually connect them and break what is, as Rob explains, out of line, Mike does in his work as well, when you actually break these distinctions, disciplinary distinctions, you're a sociologist, so you study the social, you study a political scientist, you study the political, you're an international relations person, you study the international, which is part of the limit of politics, and so on. So you break these and you work between them. More generally, it's also seen as working across multiple disciplines. So you draw on your geography, you draw on aesthetic theory, you draw on philosophy, you draw on God knows what, to actually get together. That's some of the key ideas around transversality that are embedded, and hence this volume, and it's not what's involved in editing, on transversal lines. <coughs> so, but it's about connecting in some way, not about separating. And what's at stake in connecting? But it's also connecting in very much more, isn't, sorry, I was going to say concrete, but that's not what I mean, because the disciplinary tracks are highly concrete, uh, so it's not an abstraction. What I meant is other phenomena. Like, for example, there is an embedding and drawing on lines that go back to the interest in transnationality, in lines in terms of, you know, when the state doesn't organize the world necessarily, just what does it need to start thinking in terms of assembly, transnational lines, networks, and so on. But also, there is a lot of interesting questions about mobility, migration, and the most innovative work. I'll see if I can come back to that. It's not about migration as crossing from one state into the other, but migration as seen as a different form of sociality, of living, of moving, of doing things, which is different. It's not by crossing a line. It really is, it, you grab what does it mean to be, what do migrants do, and so on. And then, and then you have all kinds of connections with neighborhoods, with the state, with the police, you know, with the shops with the unions and so on. So you've got lots of stuff going on at that point. Similar things about literature on the everyday, those things and interesting communications. So in some way there is a lot of stuff going on that is what we call, I think that's why we introduced the term, connecting, uh, rather than separating. Yeah? Now, the paradox is that part of the critical tradition in which IPS sits as well has a focus on questions of limits as Joao explained. I'll make it more concrete. For example, you understand the limits of rights regimes. So to understand citizenship, you look at the non-citizens, who are the limit of citizenship. And therefore, so that's, a, that's an element. But the criticality is not just about showing how the separation is important for understanding both terms that are there, but you focus on separation, and you take position on the side of the excluded, the non-citizen, the other, and so on. So you have that kind of dynamic that's going on. But it's built on separation and on the limit of the order, usually. The migrant, the abject, the excessive, becomes basically the challenge to the order, but also to which you understand the order. So it's a focus on limits, and it's 
part of what we propose is, I think, that the political capital of these critical approaches is actually invested in drawing attention to lines and limits and taking that position with the other. Yeah? Now, that sounds like paradoxical. On one hand, you do lots of connecting, right? Where you try actually, and I'll come back to that, connecting is not understood as moving from one side of the line. So I'm sitting here, you're sitting there, and so we're talking to one another. But there is still the line, right? That organizes our position. Connecting, I'll come back to, I'll give an example. I'll use my five last minute to give an example what that could mean. So there is a lot of that connecting that is trying to think in terms of not thinking in terms of lines, limits, and so on. And so the proposal would be that, and this is not saying that lines and limits are not important, and so on, but I think there is a discussion brewing, let's put it that way, let them make it our position, that will come up in IBS and increasingly, will increasingly come up, where one is actually trying to explore that what is real okay as connecting and trying not to think connecting as crossing limits and therefore bringing the limits back in. And that some of the creative work that's currently gonna ha happen and that I expect is gonna happen is gonna be there. Yeah? So let me know, and that's not surprising because it actually hangs together with a number of things among others that there is an increasing understanding that classical connect distinctions between nature and human and so on, actually that there is much more the ideas of entanglement Things are entangled, there are multiplicities at play, not clear dichotomies to which we organize lives, and so on. These ideas come on the back of the Anthropocene, the colonies work, for example, but also comes on the back of, for those of you who are assembling approaches and active network theory, this idea that there is not one world, the worlds are to get, not two worlds, but what's being made is actually various things coming together all the time. Yeah? So I think that's one of the reasons. Now let me give it. This has implications though, and that's where I think the debate is going to be. But to do the implications, I'm going to make, talk about an example. I'm going to take surveillance, because it's quite simple to do, I think. Maybe it's not so simple, but I'll give it a go, right? So what is surveillance? How is that organized? How do surveillance studies organize the practice of surveillance? They identify a system of surveyors, or so you have in CCTV you've got the camera and the guards, and they survey, and they do a particular thing. And then you've got the surveyed, where basically the targets, the victims, or whatever you call them, of the surveyed. And so there is actually a kind of line drawing that takes place between the surveyor and the surveyed. And then the limits of surveillance, which is where critical surveillance studies is often very critical, is it in the critical line of critical sociology, the limit is when the surveyed starts resisting the system of surveillance. And so you see, there is an element about the dichotomization that's taking place through a line drawing, but there's also another move taking place where the separation becomes, you take position with the surveyed, and they become active in resisting. So you get a kind of dialectic relationship between the two. That's limiting and line drawing elements. And that's how we organize in surveillance studies a lot of the politicality of surveillance, and in which you bring political questions in surveillance studies. Now there's another way of looking at the CCTV and the guard surveying and the surveying, is that they are fundamentally entangled. They're not two groups. You got what is surveillance? Surveillance is some form of connecting between you know people walking in the street, cameras, you know, algorithmic systems. Guards, of course, communication lines with the police, uh, working conditions of the guards, for example, that are there, you know, all kinds of noise that happens as well that relates, so, in other words, so if you think that through, you've got a lot, not just actors, but a lot of connections that are taking place. And if surveillance is really what it means in practice and how it's enacted, is through these connections, right? Then you do not have simply a clear separation between the surveyed, because the surveyed is not one. Even if you think that, if you, if you think the security guard is, represents the system, of course the security guard also represents a worker and sits embedded in a whole other system of working rights, unionizing, that kind of stuff. 
the creator of precarious jobs. I mean, there's a whole lot around that in itself. Now, that shapes, ultimately, how surveillance is practiced. And that is not, and there's all kinds of studies about how there are all kinds of relationships between groups, how these cameras work, how they're connected to other things. It's still a bit relatively general what I want to say, but I hope that gives a sense that at that point you take an analytical position and an understanding of the situation of surveillance as not this move about the separation between the surveyed and the surveyor. And then the sort of politics comes in partly to draw the line and partly by the resistance of the surveyors. Now this, even if people go in what I said, this much more multiplying of relations, of connections, what we captured on the connections. Of course, what's the way people say there's no politics? Now, what does one do then? As I said, one reintroduces resistance, but someone that's not particularly popular, has become popular in certain circles, is Butler's move of bringing in petty sovereigns. The sovereign becomes the guard, because at some point the guard will stand up and draw the line. Say, no, you did something wrong, I call the police. And that's the core of surveillance. Now, I think the challenge of connecting is really not to make that move immediately, or actually not, and see what happens if you don't make that move. Now, that has severe consequences for the categories through which we think politics, because it means that the understanding that ultimately politics comes in through either an assertion of a sovereign decision or a sovereign element of line drawing, Yes? Where the line is between you and me ultimately, because you go to jail, I stay as a guard. Yes? Well, that you let go. That's not the core. So, what politics is left, if any, if you let go of that one? So, therefore, multiplying and under the element of connecting has actually serious consequences for how we understand and whether politics is possible. The second element is also a big debate, which is very concrete, is the question about the relevance of dialectics. It's the element where politics comes in through the resistance to, so you split always like autonomously, to have politics, and the other is the resistant one, and that brings in politics. So you have an element of a dialectic situation where they're entangled with one another, but in a serious conflict between two in element. And that's why, and that's what we have. Now, part of the argument, and that's why the after-structuralism is so important, that stru- after the post-structuralism was really an argument, not to it had many things. One of the ar- elements in it was about, indeed, questioning dialectic forms <coughs> of doing analysis, whether philosophy, sociology, or whatever it was. So not to do the dialectic form. Now, what is that's all fine, maybe, in philosophy and so on, but the question becomes, it was very difficult as well, uh, but the question becomes, what can we think? Uh, what, no, what could it mean to have non-dialectic politics? So it's both in the elements, uh, so to summarize, what connecting means, it's a stand-in, it's like a concept, not for doing the connecting between us across the line, but actually raising these questions, if you go down the line of multiplying the relationships, focus on the relations, somehow bracketing the line drawing and the limits as the organization of our relationships, our relations, yeah. what does that do? And it does do, I think, it said sovereignty as a big question about whether that is the way, what happens to sovereignty, and therefore what happens, as many would argue, to our possibility to take politics, right? And it raises the question of dialectic forms of knowledge. The, the viability and the, the relevance, and what does it mean to think non-dialectically, right? It's still a critical way, right? Not as a reproduction of or but in a creative way, in a precarious creativity, if you want to, that it happens. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I get the floor. To you, Mike. My turn, okay. Um, as I've said in the past, I'm always ill at ease when I'm asked to sort of respond to something like the future of IPS because it's something I don't think about. I'm not uh, involved in disciplinary allegiance. However, when I read um, Jeffrey and, uh, and Joao's uh, treatise on fracturing 
Um, I was very impressed both with the, uh, the sharpness of the cerebral dimension of it, but also with their passion. And so, in many ways, what I have to say is kind of an homage uh, to uh, this, that treatise. Um, because, among other things, uh, so many of the concepts they use have very strong resonances in my work. Um, so I'm going to take them one at a time. Um, one of the concepts they, they come up with is transversality. Um, and I think find that really important. Among other things, I have some work underway on the city. Um, and uh, I'll tell the anecdote. I was living in Helsinki for a week, uh, for a month in uh, 2013. On the outside of town, as I approached the city, I heard this clacking noise constantly, clack, 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 and I was thinking, what's going on? It turns out it was skateboarders. And, um, and what struck me as really interesting is that the movement of the skateboarders was quite transversal to all the other flows in the city. The other flows being determined more or less by the political economy of daily life in, in Helsinki. And so I began to look at the uh, subversiveness of things like skateboarding and other kinds of imposed motion. Um, and I return to the text of one of my late friends, Randy Martin, the dance theorist, who talks about uh, the times in which we move together and the times in which we move against each other. So that's one concept that I found very useful. The concept of fracturing, I think, is very powerful. Um, and rather than talking about it that way, I tend to turn to the text of Deleuze and Guattari, who talk about the difference between molar and molecular kinds of, kinds of phenomena. Um, the molar being the individual, the nation state, a place like Africa, which Madame Bay points out, there's no such thing. There's simply a variety of different kinds of forces which incorrectly get assembled under the concept of Africa. And so critical work, among other things, substitutes uh, molecular forces at work with inside what are regarded as molar entities. Okay. The other concept I want to come up with is uh, the concept of interference, which I also found. Uh, in my own work, one of the, the uh, methodological orientations I've had is what Cesare Casarino, a, a literary theorist, calls philoesis. You take philosophical, critical concepts and you interfere with artistic texts, which are collections of affects and percepts. And so what critical work does is create a collision between those two things, and that's where the interference takes place. Okay, finally, I want to get into a text that I've been working on that's in press at the moment. It's called, it's called The Political Sublime. And the reason why I'm interested in the sublime is because the sublime is a moment when basically your, your comprehension is radically challenged by the enormity of something that has taken place. And I'll begin with an anecdote. Because this is at the very beginning of my text. When the San Francisco earthquake hit in 1989, I called my sister's house because they lived in San Francisco to see if everything was okay. And on the phone was my three-year-old niece, um, Hannah. And I said, what was it like, Hannah? And she said, uh, very big. And I said, how big? And she said, too big for my daddy to hold. Um, that's the sublime, basically. It's interesting because her daddy is a five foot six Chinese guy. He's not very big. <laughs> Okay, I want to move on to uh, the things I do read. I don't read IR, but I read the obituaries in the New York Times. And, uh, <laughs> recently, I struck gold. A man named Hans Breder died recently, and he's created an intermediate, intermediate lab at the University of Iowa. And I'm just going to give you a sense of what that's about, because it fits very nicely in terms of the kind of transdisciplinary critique we're talking about. In October 1967, five years after Art Forum published its first issue, I sat next to Marshall Duchamp, quite by accident, while Jean Tingley presented his Rotaza, Rotaza No. 2 as part of the Second World Congress. I had just created the first graduate program for the study of intermedia at the University of Iowa. I remember being hyper aware of being in the room with Duchamp and Tingley, two artists who embodied concepts that I wanted to imbue with new meaning. My program conceived of intermedia not as an interdisciplinary fusing of different fields into one, but as a constant collision of concepts and disciplines. Okay, that's what I, what I wanted, why I want to pursue this a little bit further. All right, let me get into uh, the methodological justification for part of my sublime text because it has very strong resonances with what uh, Joao and Jeff are up to. I have a section I call textuality. 
attentive to Roland Barthes' theoretically pregnant remarks on the historical movement from work to text. I treated text as a methodological field rather than simply as an object or a fragment of substance occupying part of the space of books. What constitutes it is its subversive force with respect to old classifications. The text practices an infinite deferment of the signifier, although its field is that of the signifier. It must not be conceived in, the, in this in instance as the first stage of meaning, but as its deferred action. Why that's important to me is because to talk about the sublime in the Kantian situation is to talk about what the movement is from one's apprehension of an event to ultimate comprehension. And as far as Kant was concerned, the mind is so much bigger than the world that that movement takes place very quickly. What interests me is how it's deferred and the way in which what gets stirred up is a whole variety of oppositional communities of sense which negotiate what the significance is going to be. Okay. Taking up Barth's distinction and playing into the challenge of disciplinary allegiances, John Mowat sees textuality as succeeding where discursive fact practices fail their critical mission. For example, looking at the historical discourse on sexuality, he notes that as Foucault points out in his history of sexuality, quote, Freud remained ensnared within the apparatus of sexuality, end quote. Seeing such discursive formations as caught within the confines of disciplinary fields, Mawat treats the text as an anti-disciplinary field rather than as an intra-disciplinary object. Quote, the text is divided against itself, not only in terms of the way it straddles the domain of examples and models, but also in terms of the way it links the constitution of examples to the utopic, to the not yet integrated, resulting, I would add, to an opening of the spaces that the discursive practices of disciplinary orthodoxies have closed. And there you can see the resonances of what that position is with what Jeff and Joao were talking about. Moreover, and importantly for the sense that I derive from texts, from Mawat, the plural character of the text, for example, Barth, has less to do with some bland notion of multiple meanings than with the empowerment that enables our constructions to be endlessly challenged, not merely contested at the level of conclusions, but subverted at the level of disciplinary legitimation. Jacques Rancière has a similar take on the closural aspects of disciplinary knowledge. Disciplinary sensibility, for example, in the case of sociology, has historically reconstituted the social field, such that individuals and groups at a given place would have their ethos, their ways of feeling and thinking, correspond to their place to the, in, in the collective harmony. It, like other disciplines, is part of a scientific war against allodoxy of judgments, multiplicity, in other words. What Ranciere privileges is what he calls an indisciplinary thought, not disciplinary coherence. <coughs> Reviewing Mawat's and Ranciere's versions of resisting the closural institutional supporting effects of disciplinary practices takes me back to why I've been intrigued by the ambivalence that emerged when Kant confronted the problem of the sublime. Um, and <coughs> the problem of ultimately producing what he wanted to produce, which was subjective um, finality. In other words, a census communis. As I noted in my first encounter with Kant's text in the discipline of political science, as practiced both by IR people and by political theory scholars, the focus has been on Kant's political essays. In pursuit of his ideological positions, they have sought to draw Kant into their disciplinary concerns by sifting through the treatises for content with which they can describe Kant's politics. Finding myself taking a different direction, I treated the political implications that come from an encounter with Kant's treatise on aesthetic judgment. The question I raised was about how to think the political after Kant, not to ask the question of what Kant's politics is. That's a fairly trivial kind of question. Mawat comes to a similar conclusion with respect to literary disciplines. Examining the manifesto of the tel Cal Declaration in the late 70s, which called for a separation of literature from ideology, he asks, what is at stake in the separation of literature and ideology called for in the Declaration? Obviously a great deal, he responds, but at a certain rudimentary level, what is implied concerns one's ability to read a literary text without riffling its content for statements illustrating a text's adherence to a prevalent ideological position. 
Similarly, witnessing the struggle within the text of the third critique, which for Kant recalled the philosophical project as a whole, helped me to see that a text as a philosophically engendered methodological field with implications for political analysis and encouraged to, to seek realization of those implications in my early engagement with Kant Sublime, I staged an encounter with the cinematic text, Stephen Freer's film, Dirty Pretty Things, which shows subjects in disarray caught up in the very concrete contemporary global economic sublime, a vast field of exchange that brings together those desperate, those desperate enough to sell their organs, those precarious enough to be forced to assist in the process, those predatory enough to run the business, and those privileged enough to be buyers. The film's spatial trajectory maps some of the spaces of those different types, revealing a radically divided London, differentiated by alternative trajectories of arrival and subsequent habitation, which has created an abyss between the temporary population of well-off tourists and the desperate recently arriving mostly illegal refugees, and its narrative trajectory within which the encounters among different life worlds display the contingencies of global forces provides a text that opens itself to a wide variety of critical interpretations that disrupt traditional ways of reading the city of London. I take a similar approach to the text that I turn to in my investigation, and I'll end there. Thanks very much, Mike. And um, now our last um, intervention, Rob, the floor is yours. Hi. That's what. I too find a lot to agree with in Joanne Jeff's paper. Um, I'm not going to go into it, I'd like to make a few general comments which may cut across some of the things they raise there. Um, I will focus on IPS a little bit to begin with. Um, and to end with. I, from my point of view, IPS works in two different genres, two games. One is institutional. From my point of view, IPS, as a journal, as a field, or whatever, is very much a project of institution building. And um, as such, it's a political project. The attempt to um, create spaces opportunities with very limited resources given the situation available and the intellectual context of the time to generate something other than um, prevailing in some kind of hegemonic situation. It's not the first time I've tried to do this. Um, I simply have long been in the game of trying to construct uh, some opportunities for people who are otherwise drawn into highly disciplined constraints in ways which don't make any intellectual sense to me and makes political sense to me only in relation to attempts to maintain relatively present political situations. So in the first instance, IPS is a political project. In the second sense, but also the primary sense, IPS is an intellectual slash political problem, and a very difficult one. And I can say more or less what it is intellectually by simply noting the difference between IPS and international political sociology, and I dot, P dot, S dot, from which the very terms international, political, and social, sociological, whatever, are treated as very, very difficult problems, both in and of themselves, but especially in relation. My own work outside of IPS, and I don't really regard myself as inside IPS, um, but as a participant in it, um, somehow, my own particular interests are actually much more gauged to what how the hell do you think about it? putting those three big terms together, knowing that historically they are necessarily opposed, incompatible. 
if we are to take the standard assumptions about what we're supposed to be doing as whatever, Muslims, liberal, Americans, whatever. So um, for me, it's a double game. Jeff and Joel raise a number of critiques of the critical trajectory that preceded IPF. I'm not necessarily adverse to the critiques. I might even say they don't go far enough. Um, they say not only uh, didn't the post-structuralist critique of IR go far enough in its critique of grand narratives, or its critique of origins. Well, okay. But I want to quibble. Post-structuralism didn't do a critique of grand narratives. It's a critique of logocentrism. Grand narratives is one thing, logocentrism is another. And logocentrism is a lot more important and a lot more difficult than grand narratives. Grand narratives are simply hitting it. Logocentrism go to the very root of the logic of rationality, irrationality, etc., etc. So I personally don't use the term post-structuralism either for myself or any literature in my own. People do it. I don't. Search for origins. Well, yes. Don't go far enough in our critique of origins. What does it mean to do a critique of origins? Can one get rid of origins? The physicists don't want their wretched big bang, and they therefore have all the problems that come with the concept of the big bang. Can you multiply the big bang? Can you multiply the stories of origins? It's very easy to multiply the story of origins. 1648, okay. 1492, okay. Put them together. Can't do it so easily in the discipline. So it's not so much the critique of origins. There are many different origins, and you can have, and you have long had, all kinds of attempts to pluralize those origins, to resist them, to criticize 1648 as a more or less of oldness, or at least a story only about secularization, or whatever it is. So the critique of origins, yes, it certainly needs to be criticized and criticized, but actually it goes very deep. And so, yes, you can say that mm, the critical moves whether it's Deleuze, or Foucault, or Derrida, or Uncle Tom Copley and all. So to talk about the critique of origin of founding mythologies, the practices of founding, they're not even just modern. <coughs> That's a very profound question, and I would agree that the critique doesn't go far enough, because all we did was criticize the most simplistic versions of it, which sustain the very simplistic discipline. The underlying problem is a lot more difficult. And I wouldn't say any of those famous theorists are the last word in the matter. Limits of the critique of sovereignty, yes. Limits of thinking about this relation between international and local, yes, okay. I would say a few things. One, my method is to try to take the horse to water, but I don't want to make it drink. You can never force the horse to drink. You can show, you can reveal, but if people do not want to drink, they will not drink. I'm not so convinced that it's the failure of the critique itself. One has to do a political sociology of the reception of the critique, very obviously. And I think the limits of the critique do exist, but they are limits not just within one discipline, they are limits which speak to a far wider civilizational crisis. Actually, there are many things that people cannot afford to understand. People who cannot afford to understand things are especially liberals, when liberalism is under attack, when liberalism is identified as the problem, not as the solution. International relations is a site at which that works. It is a site at which it is the left that is a problem, not the right. That problem is endemic everywhere. The left has the failure of the imagination because it always thinks it's right because it adheres precisely to the values of liberty and equality that it thinks we should all adhere to, and perhaps we should all adhere to it. But you cannot separate the attachment to those values from what we call the international, whether that's sociological or political or something else. 
to the extent that this complaint about the limited sovereignty is correct, and I ultimately believe it is, it's certainly a big, big problem. Does one simply deal with the problem by ignoring it, by pretending that sovereignties have gone away? Good luck. We're living basically in a world dominated by monotheisms and their secular assertions. And if you're dealing with monotheisms like that, you are dealing with sovereignty problems. Not the same state sovereignty. After all, state sovereignty is not the only version of sovereignty. After all, the Abraham tradition of sovereignty is not the only version of sovereignty. One can do a lot more, but actually one needs a lot of help to think about sovereignty. One needs many disciplines and a lot more acute literatures to try to get us away from all the standard narratives about sovereignty, non-sovereignty, presence, absence, air, air, and all the rest of it. It runs very deep. IPS is famously a move to practice, and I'm all in favor of the move to practice. In many senses, it's a move to practice by looking at the micro, look at the details, look at the ethnographic, look at the specifics, look at the empirical. Yes, yes, yes. I like being a human. I like all that stuff. The attention to detail. So look at the micro, look at the social practices, look at sociology. Well, sociology is not necessarily only about micro practices. It's also a reification of something we call society. And society, as a concept, is a problem. Because, of course, it's a concept that legitimizes the erasure of many, many societies, micro and macro. It's a move to the temporal. To the historical, to the processual. Yes, 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 I'm all in favor. But it runs up into a lot of conceptual problems. Long central to the way we think about politics and society and the international. What precisely is the temporal if released from the spatial? What precisely is the spatial if released from the temporal? How do we think politically with the spatio-temporal? How do we deal with this when we multiply the cultural meanings of order in the above? Interesting and important. It's the sense in which one resists the categories. This is where I love from Cole. He's the great resistor of categories. Stop reifying. He's not the first to have said that. Many have said that. Marx says that, Albert North White says that, Bob Lars says that. Stop reifying. I say this to my classes here all the time. You're reifying these damned isms. You're reifying the categories. You are mistaking phenomena for a disciplinary classification. Stop it. Pay attention to the details. Pay attention to the movement. I mean, this is not fancy. This is not radical. This is not post anything. This is quite straightforwardly simple scholarship. Stop reading through glasses that are obviously ideologically over-determining. And of course it's the shift to the how question, not the why question. Practically speaking, it's the pragmatic how question. I'm all in favor of all of that. So what is exciting about that yes, is precisely yet another return to the practices. And it is yet another return to the practices. And guess what? There have been many other returns to the practices which return to the reified category. Foucault was not immune to this, none of us are immune to this. Whitehead was not immune to this. Deleuze was not immune to this. It's the line of flight and the apparatus of capture. Both. Always both. I think this speaks to IPS as a problem. And I'm not going to say much about it. There's a history of the relationship between the political and the sociological in the academy. Which comes first? Which is more important? Which explains what? There was once a very powerful sub-discipline political sociology. Interesting one. But does one reduce the politics to the society? The social practice? Or does one say that the social practice is an effect of the political? Is it the state comes first or the nation comes first? 
Of course, it's a false act. It's a mutual implication. It's something to be decided not simply by choosing one category or another. It's complicated. And the same thing goes for many other things, not least sovereignty in the state. Can one reduce sovereignty to the government? This is a huge question historically. It's actually quite central to Brazilian politics at this moment in time. It's central to all kinds of debates about the onto theological and the governmental. Can one explain it one way or the other? This has been going on and on. Add the international to the mix. Can either the political, political science, or sociology actually deal with the international? Perhaps not. It is so obsessed, all of them obsessed with the state, with the image of the state. International relations theory is also obsessed with the state. Most of the discipline is actually not international, it's statist. It assumes the international is the sub-accumulated total of states. The methodologies are about the state. The relationship between state and international is really a matter of great interest. It's written out of the discipline, actually. Man, state, and war, choose one. Relations between them? Forget it. The antagonism between Kelsen and Schmidt? Forget it. We know that Schmidt's nasty. We don't want to admit that Kelsen's equally nasty or even worse, because he's the great theorist of international law. There's a fundamental contradiction between state and international. You can't just put them together and say there is an international political sociology. You've now here got a grand historical problem, which needs to be taken seriously and understood as an historical problem, I would say. And that historical problem is expressed nowhere better than in the categories of international political sociology.